Um, really lovely to see you all, lovely to see the place fuller than it's been for a long time. Hopefully, knowing South Street, there will be a few more coming in over the next sort of uh, 10 or 20 minutes. But a very, very warm welcome to you. And I welcome, especially if you're uh, visiting or you're back again visiting. Um, if this is the first of uh, the first service that you've managed to make it to for quite a long time, uh, be encouraged. There's loads of new faces have been visiting us over the last few weeks and months. Um, this is our first indoor service for uh, a really long time. I think we've pretty much only had one indoor service in the last two or three months. So. Um, uh, praise God for the weather. It may well be still dry when we get out later on, but the forecast was such that we thought it was safer to, uh, to come indoors. So, a very, very warm welcome to you, and um, it's great to see you. A um, couple of very brief things to do with uh, the kind of COVID situation. Um, Christchurch would really appreciate it if we don't use anything down the corridor. So, from the door that says, no entry, um, which we're used to going down to get to the toilets. They would like us not to use any of that, please. Um, so if you need to use the loo, I know it's a bit embarrassing, but come towards Tim as though you can give him a hug. Or you can sneak out the back if you prefer. And then go around, and there's a door next to the house, so you can see the light there as well. And you're down into the corridor here to Jets and right into down this corridor. Um, as far as you know, government guidelines are concerned, we no longer have to uh, wear masks indoors. We're allowed to sing, all of that kind of stuff, um, which is great. Uh, we will still keep as many outside doors open as we can get away with, just so that there is uh, constant ventilation through here. And the only other thing that we we wanted to suggest is that. Uh, you are allowed to wear a mask if you would like to, and if you see somebody else wearing a mask, please would you have the courtesy of putting the mask on to go and speak to them. That would be really helpful, because uh, everyone's in the same storm but different boats, and uh, maybe that there's a reason that they're wearing a mask that you haven't thought of, but it would just be really courteous if you see someone else wearing a mask, if you could put a mask on to go and speak to them, or maybe wait until you're outside. That would be fantastic. Um, so thank you, that would be great. Um, yeah, um, had a real thought uh, this week while I was um, just uh, spending some time in the Bible, just how uh, when the exiles um, returned from uh, Babylon, uh, when Nehemiah was able to go back to Jerusalem, he heard a report He'd been able to get permission from um, the, uh, you know, from Nebuchadnezzar to go back to uh, to Jerusalem, and um, he had to survey the, the damage, if you like. He looked around to see what state Jerusalem was in, and immediately uh, knew that he had to set about rebuilding the city walls. And um, just really struck me that you know we have been away for such a long time now, haven't we? Um, the church will look and feel different to how it was when we uh, when we before we left for for the first lockdown, and there will be lots of uh, reorganising required. There'll be lots of repairing to be done. There'll be lots of readjusting to do. Um, we've all gotten used to doing church in different ways, in our own ways, in our own homes. And so as we come back together, um, we need to have grace for each other, don't we, in readjusting to church together uh, and doing church together. So um, on that note, um, we're going to start our new series this week. Hang on just a sec. We can have a um, It's called Love Your Church. Yeah, it's really important. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there he is. He's got it. Uh, love your church. Um, 
If you haven't got a copy and you'd like one, then um, please see Rose um, in the office or just jump online. They're really easy to order and you'll probably be able to get one um, sent to you really, really quickly. Um, but love your church. Um, this is what we're going to use uh, over the next 10 weeks, um, both here on a Sunday afternoon and also in our uh, home groups together. And yeah, we just felt it was a really good um, uh, way of being reminded of um, what it means to be church together. Um, so it goes through uh, different elements of being church, belonging, welcoming, gathering, caring, serving, honouring, witnessing and sending. Um, and it finishes with a vision of your church. So really want to commend that to you. This is what we'll start today. So Peter's going to share with us later on um, in an introductory sort of way uh, for that series. So look forward to that. Um, I'm going to invite um, Chloe and Zach to come on up. They're going to come and uh, talk to us a little bit now about uh, mentoring. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Um, hopefully this is on and you can hear me. Can you hear me? Okay, cool. Um, so I've dragged Zach up here today. He's obviously really happy about it. Um, we have already been, for the past two years, I have been mentoring young people in the church, and so has Dan Northcott. Um, the premise behind it is getting together one-on-one -on -one with a young person in our fellowship and just hanging out and journeying through life with them, basically. So I wanted to get up here a few times and like, interview different young people that we, we have mentored or that are being mentored currently, to just kind of tell you guys what it is, what it's about, and hopefully get you guys involved. It's not scary, it's not terrifying, but people think it's a really scary endeavour. It's not. Um, so I'm just going to ask that a few questions, and then you can look forward to every week, hopefully, me interviewing a different young person. So, Zach's mentor has been Dan Northcott, but we are looking for someone new, so guys in the audience, isn't that? Um, so what is, like, what is a normal mentoring session? What do you do together, like a mentoring? Uh, so we usually um, go out to a cafe, um, sometimes at home, um, and usually have a cup of coffee or tea or a hot chocolate, uh, something to eat, um, and then we sit down and talk about something to do with God and just sort of catch up with uh, life in general. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, what's my next question? My next question is, what is your favourite thing? What's your favourite thing about being mentored by Dan? Uh, other than the cake. <laughs> <laughs> Just sort of really quite. Uh, I quite feel like I've got a connection. Um, and someone who really understands where I'm coming from uh, with my whole questions about God and Jesus and stuff. Love that. Um, and do you feel, if anything, that having this like extra connection outside of church and outside of youth groups, which we're doing anyway, do you think it's helped in your like journey of faith or getting to know God more? Do you think it's helped? Uh, yeah, I think it's really encouraging. Um, just it, like Dan really encourages to read the Bible and he gives sort of uh, passages to read and uh, sort of books in the Bible. Uh, really good to read about certain things and they all go over and do the research um, the, about my questions and stuff. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you, Zach. Sorry for your one spot. Um, so, yeah, Zach is one young person that we have been mentoring or has been mentored in the past. There are a few others, who are, some of them are sitting here right now, but I'm not going to drag them up because I'm going to embarrass them. Um, so, if you're like interested, even if you don't want to be part of the team, we're basically looking to build a team. Um, we would love for you to just get like chat to us about it, talk to us and pray for us as well. So if you're interested, amazing, we need male and female mentors. Um, if you're not, then come and chat anyway and I can ask you things to pray for for our group. So yeah, look forward to next time we'll be interviewing someone different about mentoring. So thank you, Zach. All good. <laughs> Amazing. And Chloe, did I, did I, do I get to just remind everyone that you're looking for more mentors? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, if that's something that you think you might be interested in, um, please go and see Chloe. That would be really, really great. Um, 
I'm sure that every single one of us here who is a believer can attribute our coming to the faith, our journey to faith, um, to one or two key people. Um, and probably after we came to faith, that formation in time, that beginning the first few steps uh, into the life of Jesus was probably greatly helped by a few very key people. Um, so, you know, that could be you for somebody else. In fact, I would go so far as to say it is you for somebody else. So, go to the to Chloe, um, that would be really good. Um, why don't we pray for that right now, um, and a bunch of other stuff, and then we'll have some uh, musical worship. That would be great. Um, Father God, thank you for our young people. Um, thank you for uh, the stand that they have taken. Thank you for their willingness to be openly known as followers of Christ. Lord, we pray that you fill me with boldness, with confidence, with joy in the Lord. Father, we pray that their faith would grow and blossom, and that they would be um, rich ambassadors for Christ, and wherever you place them. But we pray for the, um, the difficult experiences they'll have, the pushback, the criticism, uh, we pray against all of that, and we just pray that um, they would stand firm in the face of uh, whatever persecution it is that they experience in their contexts, and that you would just give them a real sense of identity in you, that their identity in you would be so secure, and so deep rooted and so joyful that, um, yeah, just that the flaming arrows uh, would, uh, would be extinguished and would be uh, just bouncing. <coughs> Father, we would also like to lift up to you um, NHS workers. Father, we're aware that perhaps now more than ever before our NHS is under enormous pressure and that there are uh, real signs of things buckling under the strain and so what we want to lift up those who are serving in that place like day in and day out and we pray Lord that you would sustain them, we pray that the presence of Christ would go with them into their workplaces Pray that they might be a beacon and a light for others. And we just pray that you would bless them. Father God. Lord, thank you for our hospitals and our GP surgeries and uh, every element of um, healthcare uh, that we all so much take for granted. And we uh, just pray for your. Uh, your name to be made known in those places. Lord, we lift up also teachers to you, especially at this time, beginning of term. And um, Lord, we just pray that uh, you give them wisdom, that you give them discernment, that you give them patience, and that you would sustain them too. Lord. Um, we already hear of uh, lots of positive test results coming back, for kids coming back to school and all the complications that that must bring to the workplace for teachers and we just pray that yeah, you would be with them and that you would sustain them. Thank you for them. Lord, we lift up those uh, who are in power in this country and we ask that again you would give them uh, wisdom and discernment that they would make decisions that are in the best interests of uh, the weak and the marginalised and the suffering. Um, Lord, we, we lift up those in Afghanistan to you and um, our hearts go out to those who are suffering, to those who have lost loved ones, to 
to those whose way of life has changed overnight, uh, to those who perhaps have once enjoyed and experienced the emancipation and who are now living in fear once again. So we just pray for them. We pray that the gospel would go out uh, in that place. So we pray for the underground church in Afghanistan. We pray that it would would grow beyond people's expectations. We pray that the peace and the freedom of Christ would just spread like wildfire beneath the surface in that country. But we pray for the many, many secret believers that there are in Afghanistan right now. And we pray that you would come alongside them, that you would embolden them, that you would give them safety and security. And we pray, Lord, that ultimately peace and justice and freedom of uh, belief and expression and speech would prevail in that place in the long term. And we thank you that uh, that's the kind of world that you love. <laughs> and Lord, we're just going to take a moment of silence now as we come before you just to prepare our own hearts as we come to worship you together. So if you're not part of a house group, speak to Seth, speak to Rose, speak to me. We'd love to see you in a house group. Um, and uh, yeah, get a copy of the book, get reading, and get hungry. Let's, uh, should we stand and watch it together? You can, you can sit as well, but standing together is part of us doing something together corporately. We're doing it together, we can see each other, we can encourage one another. A little quote here from Smith Wigglesworth that says, If you want to grow in God's grace, get hungry to be fed by it. 
first to cry out for it and broke God so that he can't live without it. Let's let's get our own with God.
and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Uh, let me pray for Peter before he comes uh, to share with us from that passage. Um, Father, thank you uh, that you have gifted Peter with being able to open the scriptures up to us, to explain uh, what you have in store for us from your word. Lord, I pray that you would just prepare our hearts right now and that you would open our hearts and our eyes to receive uh, your word for us uh, in this place. Amen. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hey. It's great to be back. Um, it's five o'clock already. No one will be offended if you have to leave. The service is obviously going to go on a little while. Um, but we're now going to look at uh, the introduction to our series. So, uh, school term has started, hasn't it? Our swallows on the farm are all gone. We've got some Scottish swallows, I think, that have come down just on the way. Um, the sun is now setting at 7.30 in the evening. And we're beginning a new series um, in the messages in our service and in our home groups, as uh, Seb and Tim have already told us. We're going to be using this little book, which you've seen already, Love Your Church, which has eight chapters, each concentrating on one uh, particular aspect of church life. It's a great book. I've really, I've really enjoyed reading it. But before we embark on this, I think we need to make sure that we know what we mean by church. What is church? What does the Bible mean when we read the English word, the English word church? Well, let's start by looking at that word. I think this is really interesting. We can trace the origins of the, of the English word church right back to Greek. And we can see how it's evolved in different <coughs> phases of, of European history with various waves of invasion. The Goths, conquered Rome in about the 3rd and 4th century and they ruled most of Central Europe and they brought into Europe, the Goths brought into Europe, the Greek word Kyriakon. Now if you know a little bit about New Testament Greek you'll know that the Greek word for Lord is Kyrios and Kyriakon means belonging to the Lord, of the Lord, the Lord's. And there are records from about 400 AD onwards of the word Kyriakon being used of a building where Christians met, or a place of worship. It's not a word found in the Bible. Then of course the Saxons, who were also Germans from Saxony, came and invaded Britain in the 6th and 7th centuries. And they brought with them the same word, but by then it had become the word Kyriaka, Kyriaka, referring to a place of Christian worship. And Kyriaka, of course, then is amalgamated into Old English, and it becomes across Europe, Kerk, with an E, which is church in Dutch. It becomes Kirche, which is church in German, it becomes church in English and it becomes K 
Kirk in Gaelic Scots. Unfortunately, it's always meant a building, it's meant a place where Christians worship. So it was, I think it was a pity that when the, the translators of the Bible who translated from the Greek and the Hebrew into English, translated our first English Bible, when they came across the word for church, or what they thought was church in the Greek, they used that word, they used the word church. Because the Greek word they were translating is the word ecclesia. It's not the word Kyriakon or Kyriaka or Kirk. It's the word ecclesia. And that means something completely different. The word ecclesia never refers to a building anywhere in the Bible. It occurs about 114, 115 times in the New Testament, but it never refers to a building. It means a summoned crowd, a mob that has been called out for a purpose, a gathering of people that's been instructed to assemble. And it's used in the Bible of both Christian and non-Christian crowds. It has no specifically religious meaning. The word ecclesia is not a religious word. It means a mob that's been assembled because of an instruction or a command or an event. It's used, for instance, of the crowd that was rioting in Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. So with this in mind, look at Jesus' famous words in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus said, very well known verses, Jesus said, and you are Peter, let's talk to the apostle Peter, the disciple Peter at that stage. You are Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church. And that's the word ecclesia. And because we've got such a fixed idea of what church is, we read this this way. We read it, on this rock I will build my church. Well, that's not what Jesus was saying. That's not his meaning at all. That's wrong. What Jesus was saying was this. On this rock, I will build my church. I will build my crowd. I will build my mob. I'm going to have a mob, an ecclesia, a crowd, a gathering that belongs to me. And the gates of hell will not prevail against you. So the first lesson, our first lesson, is that the church is a crowd of people. Have you ever done this with the children? I can't do it these days very well. You ever done this? Yeah. Here's the church, and here's the steeple. Look inside, and there are the people. Well, I've only got half a steeple. <laughs> it's wrong, isn't it? It should be, here's the church. They're people worshipping beneath the steeple. That's the way it should be. So our first lesson is that the church is Jesus' mob, Jesus' crowd. That's what he meant when he predicted it and prophesied it in Matthew's Gospel. The second lesson is obvious and, and, and follows from it, doesn't it? Which is that the church is all about Jesus Christ. It's not about the style of the building. It's not about the form of the worship. It's not about whether it's Presbyterian or Episcopalian governance. It's all about Jesus. And if the church or a church is not about Jesus Christ, then it is not a church. It's a club. Or it's an organisation of religious hobbyists. We saw, just as an aside, we saw how the English word church came down from the Goths and the Saxons using that word Kyriakon to English. But that wasn't the case for all European languages. Have you ever thought about this? Because the word ecclesia, the Greek word, the proper word, the mob word, has persisted in some languages. 
So in French, the word for church is église. That's where it comes from, ecclesia. In Spanish, it is iglesia, again, from that same Greek word, ecclesia. And even in Welsh, would you believe, the word for church is eglouis, which is from ecclesia. They don't use the word church, kirk, kyriakon. They use the word man mob, crowd, called out assembly. Anyway, just to the side. So we've seen it occurs about 100, 115 times in the New Testament, I think. And it always refers to a group of people belonging to Jesus. But it has two, two specific meanings, two distinct senses. First of all, it, it refers to the entire company of Christian believers throughout the world and throughout a region and for all time. This is sometimes called the church universal. The worldwide church. This is the whole of Jesus' mob in heaven and on earth. It's made up of all and of any who acknowledge him as their Lord, follow him as his disciple and submit to his authority. The universal church. Examples of this are obviously that verse from Matthew uh, chapter 16, I will build my church. But there are other examples too. In Acts chapter 8, it says that Saul, who was then a, a murdering swine, Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. In Acts chapter 9, it says, then the church throughout Galilee and Judea and Samaria enjoyed a time of great peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord, and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. The universal church. But New Testament references to the church universal, the universal church, are actually in the tiny minority. Most of the, those New Testament references apply to the second sense in which the word is used. The local church. Jesus mob in a specific place. Jesus crowd, the Jesus crowd who meet together for prayer and fellowship and study and worship and encouragement in a given location, the local church. Just a few examples. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 16, the churches in the province of Asia send you their greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord and so does the church that meets in their house, the ecclesia, that meets in their house. Colossians chapter 4, he writes, Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. Galatians 1, he says, I was personally unknown to the churches in Judea that are in Jesus Christ. And of course, seven local churches are mentioned in the first three chapters of the Revelation. The church universal, the, the, the worldwide church, the body of Christ, includes only genuine Christian believers. And it includes all genuine Christian believers of all denominations, all creeds, all races, all stamps, all colours. It's the church universal that's in view at the end of the Bible, in Revelation, where Jesus is seen in glory and it says of Jesus, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. That's the church universal. And if we're Christians today, this afternoon, we belong to the church universal, the great multitude. Now the local church is different. The local church may include people who are not Christians, people who are not part of the universal church, people whom we will be surprised not to find in heaven, people who are simply churchgoers without a genuine relationship with Jesus. And our study, our study is all about 
the local church, about this church, our church, our world. So let's look at two passages briefly that open up to us what the, what the local church is. First of all, the passage that Seb read from the, from the end of Acts chapter 2. You know the story, it's the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit has come as the universal gift to all Christian believers. The apostles have shown miraculous ability to speak in foreign languages that they didn't know. And the people who came from all those countries that are listed understood what, what was being said. And then there's this tremendous response to Peter's message and preaching. And it says then in verse 41, those who accepted his message were baptised and about 3,000 were added to the church to their number that day. Then it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. And then it says... They continued to meet together in the temple courts, breaking bread in their homes and eating together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. 3,000 people were converted. Have you ever thought about the practicalities of mentoring and discipling 3,000 new Christians in Jerusalem? The passage gives us some clues. First of all, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread and prayer. This is the core of local church life. Devotion, that is commitment, understanding of scripture, the apostles' teaching, fellowship, communion and prayer. Notice that it doesn't say worship. That's because it's all worship. That's because every element of church life is worship. We have musical worship. We worship the Lord when we take communion. We are worshipping the Lord when we study his word. It's all part of worship. And then it says that they met together in the temple courts. Herod's temple at that time was massive, it was absolutely huge, it covered the whole thing, it was a big sprawling conglomeration of courts and buildings and porches, it covered about 90 acres, it consisted of an array of all sorts of, of platforms, stone platforms on various levels. They could probably have fitted 3,000 people into one of those temple courts, except that men and women weren't allowed to be together in the temple. They had to be separate. There were separate places for the women, separate places for the men. And the passage says that more people were being converted every day. So within a little while, there might be 4,000 people there. And we know from the descriptions that none of the temple courts probably could have accommodated a crowd of that size. So the whole cohort of those three or 4,000 people in Jerusalem, right at the start, Right at the start, it's a bit like the universal church, the church universal. But the key to their spiritual lives was clearly that smaller groups were meeting in smaller buildings. They broke bread in their homes, it says, and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God. It's really inconceivable that three or four thousand Christians met in anyone's house. Or it's very unlikely that they met all together at all. And this sets out a really important principle, which is this. Our engagement with the universal church is through our local church. No one in Jerusalem was saying, I belong to the church universal. I don't need to belong to a local church. This happened 2,000 years ago, and for about 1,800 years of church life, all Christians accepted that engagement with the church universal was through the local church. It was only with the, with the rise of, the, of the, what we call para-church organisations that the 
beginning of the 19th century that any alternative was available. <coughs> if, you were in, if you were a Christian, you were involved in your local church. And nor was it possible until the 20th century for anyone to be hooked in with a local church other than the church that was local to them. The march of technology has meant that Christians now can tune into services from, well, from anywhere in the world and devote themselves to ministries based in other countries or, or they can claim that their Christian lives are, are rooted somehow in some parachurch ministry or organisation. That, that's definitely not the biblical model. The biblical model is very squarely, as we saw in Acts, that they are devoted to, that's the word that's used, a gathering of Christians in the local area. So Christians who claim that they don't need the local church, or that they get their church online, or on the God channel, are not in line with what Jesus expects of his church. Don't, don't get me wrong, parachurch organisations are brilliant, they're, they're wonderful. Missionary organisations, Christian unions, outreach ministries, Christian publishers, everything from I don't know, Mission Aviation Fellowship through Tear Fund and Vision for Asia and Desiring God and Scripture Union and the Gideons and, and the Bible Project. These things are all brilliant. They're all fantastic. But they are no substitute for commitment to a local church. And in a way, look, the fact that we're all here, that you're here, means that you're committed. And I'm sort of speaking to the converted. But it's a really important point. The early church leader, Cyprian, North African, black guy, wrote in the third century, he can no longer have God as his father who does not have a church for his mother. It's interesting, isn't it? Even back then. And then, as we kind of wind up, let's look at another passage. In, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul says this, Timothy's been left in Ephesus to, to look after, to govern and pastor a, a local church, a small local church. And, and Paul says, although I hope to come to you soon, I'm writing to you with these instructions, verse 14 of chapter uh, 3, so that if I'm delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of truth. Beyond all question, Paul says, the mystery from which true godliness springs is very great. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, preached among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up into glory. Paul's writing to Timothy to give him instructions about running a small local church and he gives a very clear description doesn't he of what a local church is it's God's household the church of the living God the pillar and foundation of truth God's household God's family in other words God's family we're repeatedly told in the New Testament that we have been adopted as Christians into God's family think about that metaphor Think about your extended family. Think about a wedding or a funeral where, where all your extended family come together. You don't know them all intimately. Some are lovely, attractive people who you really enjoy spending time with. Others are <clears throat> tricky, difficult. Some are downright embarrassing. Some you wish you didn't have in your family, but you can't change it. That's the point of the metaphor, because it's the same in our local church family. We are adopted into it. We are each related to each other in the life of Christ by his spirit. There will be people with whom we don't agree. There will be people whom we love dearly and whose company we really enjoy other people whom we find difficult. It's a family. And devotion to this family is part of our 
Christian commitment and making it work by the power of the Spirit, as Paul says elsewhere, keeping the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace is a fantastic witness, it's a great witness to our local community. And so leaving a local church because of something that you disagree with or because someone has offended you or because you don't like some peripheral aspect of the way things are done, that's really a very immature and a sad thing to do. Secondly, Paul says that it's the church of the living God. It's God's church. This is God's church. Specifically, Jesus' church. It doesn't belong to the pastor or the leaders or the denomination. It belongs to him. It's what he intended when he said, I will build my church, my mob. And as members of the local church, we must always seek his will for our fellowship and not pursue an agenda of our own. And then Paul says that the local church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. Church leaders have enormous responsibilities to make sure that members are taught the truth. And members, all of us, have responsibility to encourage our leaders to teach scripture and to teach from scripture. Personal opinion, personal politics, personal hobby horses have no place in this pulpit. If local churches teach biblical principles and biblical precepts, the Holy Spirit will enable us as members to construct biblical foundations for living. A mature Christian viewpoint, which is really important, will only be nurtured by understanding the truth of biblical teaching. Seth mentioned Nehemiah returning after the exile from Babylon. Remember what it says about the leaders of the congregation in Nehemiah, in Nehemiah's time. It says this, Nehemiah 8.8, 8, one of my favourite verses in the Old Testament. It says, they read from the book of the law, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. That's the job of the speaker in our services. To read scripture, to make it clear, to give the meaning, and to make sure the congregation understands what's being read. No more, no less. That's it. So, the local church is the, is the household of God, the church of the living God, the pillar and the foundation of truth. And then Paul, as we finish, for some reason, and it seems a little bit out of kilter with, he's talking about practical things, and, and then he suddenly launches into this sort of um, lofty poem about Jesus. Beyond all question, the mystery from which true Godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, preached among the nations, believed on in the world and taken up into glory. He's talking about the local church, and yet he launches into this lofty summary of Jesus' ministry. That's because, as we said at the beginning, it's all about Jesus Christ. Our church is his mob, his crowd, his assembly. Let's never forget that. Let's just pray. Lord, thank you for adopting us. Thank you for calling us. Thank you for giving us your spirit. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And we pray that as we embark on this study of our local church, your church, that you would challenge us and you would draw people in so that we may glorify your name and influence this community for you. Because we ask it in your name. Amen.
place that we can come and be in church. Father, thank you that you have promised to build the church. This is an hour venture in schools. Lord, thank you that you have adopted us here. And that we are a model. That we are Jesus' model. I pray, Lord, now that you would fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. That you would send us out to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes to be bold about our faith in the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. 